you guys should be able to see my screen now. And I know it's nice, so we're going to start with the lecture. So module three, module three is kind of different from module one and module two. Module three starts to get, in, and from module three of this course, we start to get increasingly more complex. The first part of that is learning how to make a decision in Python. Now, we as humans make decisions all the time. We decide what we're going to have for dinner, or we decide if it's too hot to go for a walk. Um, and those decisions make perfect sense to us. But they don't make perfect sense to Python. Python um, and all programming languages really aren't the best machines for strict decisions. They're great for algorithms because they can run so fast. But they're, they're, it's not intuitive to ask Python a question. We have to learn how Python thinks so that we can ask it a question and have it give us back an answer. So a bit of background. Algorithms. Um, this is really your first part of writing an algorithm. Well, what's an algorithm? It's basically just a series of statements in a computer language that you will use to solve some kind of computational problem. Think the game that's in week seven. There are a couple of different algorithms you have to write for that. So the foundation of algorithms is module three, what we're going to start tonight. Module four, which is looping, which is actually kind of an extension of branching, of, of decision making, because in loops you make a decision, the same decision, again and again and again. Module five is functions. Data structure is six. Uh, data storage, so you're writing it to files, is seven, and object oriented is eight. eight. Branching, looping um, are the the basic, the first two things you need to get down. Functions make your code easier to read and write, but it involves understanding the problem enough to kind of slice it. Data structures are great because they teach you how to organize your data. Data storage is writing it to disk. And object-oriented is just a concept and a way of combining both your functions and your data into a structure. So that's basically what we're doing heading forward. Tonight, we're going to be doing branching. So first, we've got some more keywords. And there's an order to these keywords. Um, so if, elif, and else. If tells Python that it is going to make a decision that you have given it a true-false question, and it has to decide the true or false. Elif is another way to make a decision in Python, and it is related to the if. You cannot have an elif without an if. And you can have as many elif statements as you want. And lastly is the else statement, and that basically says, if every other test that I've given you has failed, then do this. And for branching, the only one that's required is an if statement. That's the absolute minimum that's required is an if statement. A lot of times you'll have if and else statements, and sometimes you'll have if and else statements. And basically, um, we're going to go through each of the different scenarios. We're going to talk about some scenarios associated with the labs this week, because the labs are a little um, more complex this week than they've been in previous weeks. And yes, at the end, we are going to go over the labs, and I'll answer any questions you have. So we had new keywords. Now we have some new relational operators. Well, what's a relational operator? Relational operator is just an operator we use to make a decision, and it basically relates 
what's on the left-hand side of the equation to what's on the right-hand side of the equation. When we have a variable, I always talk about it, you, have, you know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And on the right, of course, there is some form of data. Well, relational operators kind of take that to the next level because instead of assigning a value to a variable, you are testing a value against a variable. So we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a relational operator. We can kind of say that. And the relational operators that we have at hand that we can use in Python are double equal signs, which means is equivalent to. For the last two weeks, I've said single equal sign. On the left-hand side of a single equal sign, you know it's a variable. That's because there is a double equal sign. And the double equal sign says, is what's on the left of me the same as what's on the right of me? We also have not equal to, which is just the opposite. Is what's on the left-hand side of the operator different than what's on the right-hand side? We have less than, less than or equal to, greater than, or greater than or equal to. And those are all the same as they are in math. Then we have Boolean operators. So yeah, there's three slides tonight. Boolean operators basically relate questions. So, and we'll get, we'll get into this a little bit more later. But basically what you have is you might have a series of questions that you want to ask. And depending on the outcome of each individual one, you want to combine that outcome to a single answer. The thing that controls the combination is Boolean operators. And we're going to go through the difference of, of how Boolean operators work because AND summarizes things differently than OR. So, Boolean values, there are only two of them, true and false. That's it. Up until this week, we just used pretty much ints, floats, and strings. Boolean operators, sorry, Boolean values are simply true and false. That's all they can be. It is either true or it is false. There is no in-between, and Boolean operators are made for branching. So, a scope. Scope is not a topic that Zybooks talks much about, but I find it important when you are starting to write branches and then loops and functions, you have to understand what scope, what scope your code is in when you're reading your code. So what is scope? The scope basically dictates when code is available to execute or when a variable is available to be used. Up until now, variables, as long as they were defined, they could be used. Um, that changes a little bit this week. And there are three scopes. There's the global scope. Everything we've done so far is in the global scope. There is the local scope. And the local scope, local code, is what's inside of a class, inside of a function, inside of a loop, or inside of a branch. And I'll tell you what, show you what inside means. And then there's the built-in, which is special for Python, and we don't worry about that. There is one other scope, but we don't even brush on it in this class, so I don't really talk much about it. So those are the new concepts that we now have to roll into working programs. Um, does anybody have any questions? Hold on. There's the thing. Okay. Nobody has any questions. Okay. So those are the things we have to kind of roll together to do this branching. So syntax formatting and scope. Now I'm just using um, 3.2.2. And so this basically says you're gonna, you got something called user h. It's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Then I have this new if and else and these print statements under them. So let's take a closer look at, let's start with 
what's in what scope. So we have user age, if user age less than 18, else, all in blue. And those blue colors are there so that we can distinguish them. This is global scope code. It's just like everything we've already written. It's all left hand, left defined. You're always going to be at the, you're going to be left justified. And um, this code can be accessed from anywhere in your script. Now, the two print statements say local scope. What that means is, is that in essence, those print statements don't exist until either the if statement has, well, until the if statement has either evaluated to true or evaluated to false. And I'll show you what this looks like in a minute because we're going to run through the debugger. But that's what we have in terms of scope. Now, in terms of syntax, we have our two new keywords, if and else. And if the if keyword and the else keyword are just there to say, hey, Python, you're about to make a decision. And that, that lets Python know that the next thing that it needs to have from an if perspective is the statement. So I have the word if, a space, and then some relational statement. And the way this relational statement can read is age is less than 18. Now you'll notice I did not phrase that as a question because it really is you know, like when you're in elementary and middle school and you had true-false tests where they made a statement and you either had to pick true or false. These are all true-false tests. That is what branching is. It's all about true, a test that's true and false, and now you can add them together if you want to. So that's what if and else do. That's what the statement is. The statement is a true-false test. Then we have this colon. Now, you have to have this colon. You can't forget this colon. I will break my code and show you what happens when you don't have the colon because you'll get all kind of weird errors. Um, the colon tells Python to stop evaluating the statement. It says the statement is over now. So make your decision and do what you need to do. So that is what the colon is for. Some students forget it and they go crazy. Um, and I'll show you ways to kind of avoid that by just how you read the error message. So this is the syntax formatting and scope for 3.22. Now, I kind of do it like this because I want you guys to start thinking scope. I want you to be able to read the code and understand what's in the local scope and what's in the global scope because what I find is most students when they get to branching start having trouble with not only figuring out how to get Python to give you the answer you want but um, they get the indentation wrong and they don't understand what's happening and they get weird errors. So if we can start thinking about scope when we're physically reading through the program, it will be easier when you go to write your code. So that's kind of why I've set that up that way. So computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. Computers are actually kind of dumb. Um, so Computers have an on-off switch. Let me see what the next one is. Okay, how to ask a question. Okay, I'm just going to start talking again. Computers have an on-off switch. That's all they have. When you are asking a question to Python or to any pro programming language, um, I don't know of any fuzzy programming languages that will allow you to have a non-true-false answer. I digress. Sorry. So when you are going through um, and you're writing or you're, you're even trying to think about how to ask, how to get, how to ask a question in Python, what you have to remember is that computer languages are just, are just stupid, okay? 
when you're asking a question, it's an on-off switch. And it's not even a dimmer switch. It's an on or an off. True or false. Those are the only two things it can be. So we have to figure out how to ask Python the question. So if I say, am I young? Python's going to be like, huh? So here's how I ask the question. So we're going to go back to 3.22, and I do kind of stick on this one challenge for a bit. But I promise we'll also go look at a few things in PyCharm. So user age is a test variable. It's something that we are going to test later. It's going to be part of that true-false question. And it's something I'm going to use in the if statement. Um, the test variable has to be assigned and defined, or defined and, dis and assigned, before you can use it in the branch. So we'll see that user age is being tested. User age is, Python here is saying, you know, okay, I've got an if, which means I have to make a decision. And I've got this statement that says user age is less than or equal to 18. So that is my test. The, the test that I have to answer, the test that Python has to tell me is true or false, is that statement. User age is less than or equal to 18. Is that a true statement or a false statement? We don't know right now because it's an input. Um, but that is the anatomy of that statement. So if the outcome of the if statement is true, then we're going to print 18 or less. Otherwise, we're going to print over 18 because else means when if nothing else is true, then do what's in my, my local scope. So flowchart is a visual tool. Flow, I like flowcharts. And this week, you're learning more about them. You're going to have to do an assignment. That assignment is you're going to have to do a flowchart or you're going to have to do pseudocode. So we're going to talk about flowcharts. At the end of the class, we're going to talk a little bit about pseudocode. And the examples for the labs will be in both flowcharts and pseudocodes when we go over it. So this is a flowcharting tool. And this is a flowchart of challenge 3.2.2. Um, same thing we've looked at, but not quite. In a flowchart, you have to have a few things. You have to have a start and you have to have an end. So we have these bubbles, start and end. I have to have input, I have to have output, and I have to have process. That doesn't change just because it's a flowchart. So you'll see these um, off-kilter rectangles. Those represent input and output. That's the symbol for that. Um, the diamond is a decision maker, so that's where your if statements are going to go. And you're going to have things happen based on, um, sorry, you're going to have the flow of the chart will change based on the user input. So if the user input from Professor Lisa is 21, I'm going to go down, I'm going to make a decision. 21 less than or equal to 18, true or false? Well, that's false. So I'm going to print over 18, and I'm done. So that is the flow chart when the branch evaluates to false. So now it's just all coming back together. All right, so I have 10 now. So user age is 10. So 10 is less than or equal to 18. It's going to evaluate to true. All the stuff on the false goes away, and you print 18 or less. So that, from a visual standpoint, is what is happening in the code. And I also use this visual stuff because you're going to have to do that this week. Okay, one more decision maker. So this decision maker is Elif. So I'm going to again start with 3.2.2, and I'm going to say if user age is less than or equal to 18, print 18 or less. Well, what if 
I want there to be different age groups. So I'm going to say if user age is less than or equal to 50, true or false, and then I'm going to print in the middle, and then otherwise, if nothing evaluates to true, I'm going to say no pure old. So what does this do? This gives us another related decision maker. And we really have to start talking about the relation of the decisions because this is really a chain. If, else, and else are a chain of potential events. And they relate to each other. When um, user age is less than or equal to 18, evaluates to true, Python won't ever, ever try and try that user age again. It's just going to go right down here. It's going to say, okay, this if statement was true, so it's like nothing else existed. Just like that flowchart you saw before where the actual lines disappeared, that's the concept here. So here's a quick middle age flowchart, and then we're going to go look at some code for a few minutes. So here's a um, flowchart of middle aged. We have our user input. We have our decision that we already had. If it's true, we're going to press print less than or 18. If it's false, we're going to go and we're going to do another test. And that other test is going to say, are they less than or equal to 50? If they're less than or equal to 50, they're middle-aged. Otherwise, when that, if that evaluates to false, they're going to print, nope, you're old. So all they've really done here from the first one is just add another branch because these are branches. When you look at them, that if statement branches either to true or false. And the next if, next if statement branches either to true or false. So here we go again, our little graph. So if it's 10, it's going to print 18 or less. And as far as Python is concerned, all that stuff goes away. Ah, there we go. So I'm going to print 21. 21 is not less than or equal to 18. 21 is less than or equal to 50. So everything else goes away. And that's the flow through the chart that I have. Okay, everything's back. I'm going to put 60 in there. So that's the age. 60 is not less than or equal to 50. So all of the other stuff goes away and we print no pure old. So when you're thinking about Python, you can think about when you're dealing with if, elif, and else statements, you can think about the code just not being there. Um, okay, so we're going to go out and we're going to look at some code for a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Um, okay, so we're going to start with 3.2.py. And I wanted to do this kind of just to show you a few things. So I've got a breakpoint here at line 11 because that's really the first line that I want to evaluate. Um, and let me do my configuration. 3.2.2, where did it go? Oh, there we go. Okay. So um, when I debug this, it's going to ask me for my age, and I'm going to put in 42. Now I'll put in 10 for the first one. Okay. So if I'm looking at PyCharm, and one of the reasons that I am showing you the debugger is that when you're starting to write more complex code, like the game or the text dragging game that you're going to have to write, um, it's always good to understand how to walk through your code to figure out what it's doing. So I just put in 10, and I am at user age less than or equal to 18. So let's go to variables. User age is 10. Now, if I, one of the nice things about PyCharm, if I just 
um, hold my mouse over a variable, it will tell me. So I put in 10. 10 is indeed less than or equal to 18. So I'm going to step over the if statement. So I've just gone from the global scope to the local scope. And the reason I know it's a local scope is because it is indented. And I can't stress that enough. The only way Python knows it's in the local scope is because it has been indented. And there are only certain times when you indent your code. And what we're learning here, one of those times is in branching. So Python says it's in the local scope. It's going to execute what's in the local scope. And then it's going to end. So let let me just do it. I'm just going to uh, run it one more time so we can just see it work. 42. And I get over 18. So now I want to break this a little bit. Okay? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that nice little colon. And what you will see here is you'll just see this red squiggle. Okay, so I got a red squiggle. So I'm just going to run this. And I get a syntax error, invalid syntax. And it just points to the end of 18. This is one of the times where... Sherelle Scott. Thank you. Would you please mute? Um, the lack of the colon is one of the few times that Python might actually give you valid syntactical error data. So what happens if I don't indent line 12? Well, let's do that. Now I get my red lines. I get a red line at print. I get a red line at else, another red line at print. So let's run it, and I will show you the error that you get. This is what you get, okay? Indentation error. Expected an indent block. So Python said, okay, I have an if statement. The next line has to be indented. If it's not, I'm going to throw up my hands and quit, which is what this program just did. So indenting just means hitting the tab key. So if you see an indentation error, there are a couple of different things that it could be. Hold on. Oops, let's see. No, that's okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, but that's what happens. Those are indentation errors. Now, let's see what happens if we do this. Python doesn't care if there are line spaces, but it does care about this. This is one that I've seen students do. And what happens is they end their if statement, and then they type a line of code, and then they type else. That's invalid in Python because you've kind of broken the chain. Remember when I said if, elif, and else are kind of a chain of events or a chain of possible events? Well, this print line breaks the chain of possible events. Python is saying, okay, I got this if block here. We're all good. Now I got this print statement. It's just fine. It's out in the global scope. And then it comes to this. Um, I'll get to that in just a minute. Then we get to this, and all of a sudden, it was working. All I did was put that print line, because what Python is saying is it cannot relate this else to the if that started this whole thing. Remember what I said earlier is that Python um, is expecting always to have an if. You have to have an if. You can't have an else without an if, which means Python has to relate those two keywords. So, and it cannot relate it when I put line 14 in, but it can relate it when I didn't. So, this is a chain of possible events, and they have, they are related. Let me go back and see what the message was. Okay, Zybooks was talking about the difference between a tab and spaces. Do you have a preference? I don't have a preference. However, my experience is it's just easier to tab. 
it's just easier for me instead of making it spaces I just know I tab once and I'm in this particular scope and I tab twice and I'm in this particular scope so that it's easier for me that way um, if you're in my class and you're turning stuff in I will not care if it is a tab or a space I will care if you get an indentation error from Python no problem sorry I need to take a quick sip of water okay my voice is getting gravelly so let's go back okay um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about boolean operators we've talked about relational operators um, but we haven't done anything to talk about the boolean operators boolean operators basically allow you to summarize a bunch of different statements or excuse me summarize the results of a bunch of different statements so <clears throat> if I say num it num1 is 10 num2 is 2 and I say if num1 is equal equal is the same as 10 so is that true or false well that's true and then ignore the and for a second and then uh, and then the next statement is num2 is the same as 2 is that true or false well that's true so now I have to know what to do with those two trues just kind of hanging out there on their own how do I come up with an answer based on the fact that I now have two trues well I use the boolean operator to determine what it is and in this case true and true when you add true to true it will always be true um, the other option is you have true and false so if I have num1 is 10 which would still be true and I have num2 is less than 2 which would be false now I have a true and a false hanging out there that I have to relate and so what do I do I say what is my boolean operator my boolean operator is an and so true and false is always false now we have two boolean operators we have and and we have or um, or does the opposite so if I have if for an or if one of my one of my statements is true and the other statement is true it's always true that doesn't change with an and or an or what does change is when you have both a true and a false if you have a true and a false and the operator is or you will always come out to true so when you think about it it's like um, sorry when you think about it it's kind of just like multiplying or dividing if that makes any sense so let's do simple boolean and then I want to talk to you about between that sounds kind of weird but I we, we need I need for you guys to understand the concept of between so this is my take on 3.2.2 with adding an L if we saw it in the flow chart and so now we're going to see it here okay so I have my user age I've got what's on the left hand side which is my variable user age all the time um, and I've got some print statements in the local scope so if I debug this okie dokie there we go and I'll just put this through the debugger I'm gonna make my age uh, I'm gonna make my age 25 so what's gonna happen let's walk through this and look at the variables age is 
25. Well, let's ask ourselves a question, or actually a statement, a true-false statement is how we have to deal with these. Age is less than or equal, sorry, user age is less than or equal to 18. Turns out to be 25 is less than or equal to 18. True or false? Well, that is false. So what it's going to do is it's now going to fall to the second question in the chain. In this case, we have user age or 25 is less than or equal to 50 or user age yeah, is less than or equal to 50, true or false. That happens to be true. Because that's true, I move from the global scope on line 12 to the local scope on line 13 and I print out middle age and then I'm done. Nothing else happens. I don't ever make it to here because I, I have once once one part of this chain evaluates to true, everything stops. And um, this is called mutual exclusivity. So an if statement is mutually exclusive than an elif or an else statement that follows it. What mutually ex mutual exclusion means is that once Python hits a true in this chain of if, elif, and else, it's just going to ignore everything else. It's like nothing else existed. So you have to understand that concept when you're writing algorithms. You have to understand when the data is related, you want to use an if, elif, and else statement. If the data is unrelated, you can use multiple if statements. By the way, you can have as many if statements in a, in a program as you want. There's not really a limit. So, between. Between is one of the things that, um, that really is difficult sometimes. We understand what between is from the perspective of a human, from the perspective of our world. But in Python, it's different. And you defined between using Boolean operators in Python. So if I want to know if 20 is between 0 and 4, I have to use the AND operator. And that's how you get a between. So you have age is 20. And this is a true-false test again. Age is greater than 0. And age is less than 4. Well, that's false. It, it is greater than zero, but it's not less than four. So we have a true and a false, which means it's false because there's an and in there. So then I go to the next LF statement and I said, okay, is 20 greater than or equal to four? Well, yes, it is. Is 20 less than nine? Well, no, it's not. So that's a true and a false. So it um, evaluates defaults and then we go to the next line and we say age is greater than or equal to 9 true and age is less than 13 false so true and false is false we move to age is greater than 13 which is true and age is less than 19 which is false so then the last thing we do is say infinity and beyond so let's look at between for a minute. And I'm doing this on purpose. I'm doing this because you're going to need to understand the concept of between to do your labs. Between. Okay. So this is that, my, the little between program. And let's see what happens when we change things. So I've got 20. Let me start by making age minus 1. So age is minus 1. I'm going to debug this. I don't have to put anything in. Whoops. Sorry. should have had when you debug something, it's good to have a break point. Okay. So I'm at line 5. Age is minus 1. Age is not greater than 0. And it is but it is less than 4. So this will evaluate to false, and this will evaluate to true, and it will still be false. 
So here it's going to be false because age is not greater than or equal to 4, even though it is less than or equal to 9. Same here, same here, and so it's going to print to infinity and beyond. Now, let's change it up a bit and let's make it 3. I'm going to debug this. Age is 3. I'm going to step over. And I now am saying 3 is greater than 0, which is true. And 3 is less than 4, which is true. True plus true is true. And I go in here. And I am going to print no school. And then the program is going to end. This is what I meant by mutual exclusivity. Line 5, Python knows that line 5, line 7, line 9, line 9, 11, uh, sorry, line 11 and line 13 are all related to each other. And once one of those relations is true, the rest of them disappear. They just go away. So that's what happened here. So now if I put 5, we're only going to do this one more time. I'm 5. five is five, 5 is greater than 0, which is true. And 5 is less than 4, which is false. So I am not going to execute line 6. I'm going to jump right to line 7. And you'll see on the console, line 6 never got printed out. Now, age is 5. It says, Age is greater than or equal to 4, which is true. And age is less than 9, which is true. And by the way, here's a neat little hand, handy feature in PyCharm. If you want to know if something is true or false before the line is executed, when you're on that execution line but you actually haven't done it, you can simply hover over that particular part of the if or else statement, and Python, or sorry, PyCharm will tell you. So I know that this is true. Five is less than nine. I also know, uh, it's being a little, there it goes. I also know that age greater than or equal to four is true, and Python will tell me how that evaluates, so that I in my head can say true and true is true. So, I'm now going to print line 8 and the program ends because these are mutually, mutually exclusive. Okay, so let's go here. Complex questions. So, um, one of your labs is extremely complex tonight. It's the one with all the coins and it trips a lot of people up. So, this is a way of kind of talking about the concepts associated with that lab, but not actually talking about the answer to the lab. So, what are we trying to do? Well, we're writing an algorithm. That's what we are doing here. That's what we did in between. That's what we're doing here. That's what you're going to be doing in your labs from here on out which is why this, this foundation is so important. So here I've just got, given the number 223, find the number of 100s and the number of 10s, output plural if more than one, output singular or none if zero. So that's the complex question. It's written as a sentence. You're not given a lot other than a value and what they want. That's it. So here in the code, I have an assignment, num equals 223, hundreds equals 223, slash, slash, 100, or backslash, backslash. i sorry, I can never remember. Um, that double slash is the floor operator. We originally talked about the floor operator in week one. Um, it is different than modulo and it is different than um, division. 
you cannot solve the problem correctly for this for that lab and for this complex question if you do not use the floor operator. And basically what the floor operator does is it says only give me a whole number back because if you said 223 divided by 100 you'd get 22.3. But we don't want 22.3. We want to know the number of 100s. How many times can I multiply 100 and not exceed 223? So that's what the floor operator does. And then I'm going to have num minus hundreds times 100 so I can get the remainder for the tens. And I'm going to do a modulo again for the ten. And so now that was just the calculations. Now I get to the part where I'm really talking about the algorithm. So the algorithm basically says if, if, I, if hundreds is zero, then I'm going to print no hundreds. If hundreds is greater than one, I'm going to print number of hundreds is. And otherwise, I'm going to say there aren't any hundreds. So we have three decision points here. And we have an if, elif, and else. We know they're all mutually exclusive. So one of these, and only one of them, is ever going to be printed out to the screen. And now I do the same thing for tens, except I forgot to change hundreds to tens. Sorry about that. But to get this problem right, we have a non-trivial number of lines of code. Because we have, because of what we want to do. Now this Word problem doesn't look that much longer than some of the word problems in the last two weeks, but the um, solution is more complex because now we're got, we, we've got to ask a lot of questions. So this is just the rest of the bullets here. And let's go out and look at floor.py. Okay, so... Floor.py, here's our little floor thing. Um, here we are. Okay. So I define money and I have, you know, 100 is 100 and a quarter is 25. So I'm going to basically do the same thing or something similar. In this case, I have dollars equals money divided by hundreds. I'm going to print the dollars. I'm going to print the amount. I'm going to print the quarters just so I know what's going on. And then I'm going to go down here and I've got some nested if statements. And nest, you can nest if statements. You can have an if statement inside of another if statement or an else or an elif. Um, and that's an important concept is a is nesting because you can in this in this week we're going to nest nest if statements within other if statements next week we're going to nest if statements in loops and loops and loops so we start to get more complex so let us debug this it says money is 100 we have our 100 variable, which just stores the value 100. Our quarter value, which stores the value 25. I'm going to say dollars, sorry, money floor 100 is the number of dollars that I have. So I have $1 and 150, which makes perfect sense. And I'm just going to print that out. Now I want to figure out what my money left, my amount left is. So I'm going to say amount equals money minus dollar times 100. So the amount that I have left is 50. So now how many quarters do I have out of that 50? So I'm going to use my floor operator again. And so I have one 100 and two quarters. So now I have to figure out how to print them out because right now the only thing I've got is that and it makes no sense if you're just looking at the console. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to 
create an algorithm. And a couple things to look at here, okay? You will see that line 15 is an if statement and line 22 is an if statement. There are no, in the global scope, these are two in the global scope, there are no other if statements and there are no elif statements or else statements in the global scope and that's because I don't need them. But what I do need is two, two um, branches, each branch dealing with a separate data. So amount, sorry, dollars is separate from quarters. When it comes to printing out, I want to print out my dollars with some things and I want to print out my quarters saying some things. So that is why you see two independent if statements. An if statement, these are not chained. These have no relation to each other because the variables have no relation to each other. I don't care if I don't print out a dollar when it comes to quarters. Quarters doesn't care. Dollars doesn't care if I'm going to print out quarters. I want to, I, I am dealing with two different independent data points here, dollars and quarters. So that's why there's no if, else, else relationship in the global scope. Now, we get to the local scope. Let's just talk about lines 16 through 20. 16 through 20 is in the local scope of the uh, dollars greater than zero branch. So anything that happens in there is fine. I can get to dollars because dollars has been defined outside this scope. And I can then also have an if and an else statement. So I have if dollars is one, is equivalent to one. I'm going to print something and if L, otherwise I'm going to print dollars. So now if we look at just line 18 for a second, um, line 18 is not only in the local scope of the outer if statement, it is also further in another local scope of this inner if statement. So when I was talking to you about reading things from the prospect of or from the vantage point of scope, this is what I'm talking about. It's important, especially when you're starting to get into eight rooms and you know having an inventory of of things they can win and knowing whether or not they're gonna you know have this horrible fate happen to them at the you know if they hit the wrong room before they get all of their stuff, that is all understanding how to relate, how, when things, when data points are related and when they're not related and how to handle them. So that's kind of what we're looking at here and that is going to be important in your lab. So um, I am at line 15. I, I have one dollar, so one is greater than zero. I'm going to print the number of dollars, and I, but I don't want to. I don't want to end it with a new line. I want to end it with a space. And now I'm, I want to say dollar behind that or dollars. So if dollars is one, I'm going to print out the word dollar. Otherwise, I'm going to print out the word dollars. So in this case, I'm going to print dollars, so I have one dollar. And now, irregardless of what happened to this, this equ equated to true, and it doesn't matter, because I'm down here and I am dealing with a completely separate data point. So quarters is greater than zero. So I'm going to print the number of quarters, which is two. And then I have more than one quarter, so I did not hit line 25. And now I'm going to hit line 27 and I'm going to say quarters. So if you're looking for some hints on one of your labs, that's the hint. Okay, flow charts as a visual tool. I think um, I've talked about these in other lectures and these are just example flow charts and how to read them. 
since it is almost 10 o'clock, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the labs, and then if there's time, we can circle back, and if you want to circle back. If you don't, then we'll just go and ask questions, but I think before people, before my brain turns to complete mush, which happens at 10 o'clock, um, I'd like to go over the labs. So, if I go to Zybooks, 3.11, smallest number. Oh. Wait a minute. Okay. Write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of the three values. Do I have that? Hold on. 3.11. That's it. Okay. So I've got two different things here. I have got a flowchart and then I've also got pseudocode. And I'm starting to talk about pseudocode this week because one of the things you're learning, and with the complexity of the remaining labs, I will most likely only be talking about pseudocode. So, let's see, lab 311, we basically are looking for the smallest of three numbers. So, I'm going to input one number, I'm going to input a second number, I'm going to input a third number. So, this is about Boolean operators, and it is about an if, elif, else chain, or an if, elif chain. And that's what if and elif looks like. It's an if statement and then another if statement, and they're related based on the outcome of the first one. So I've got one if statement that says if num1 is less than num2. Whoops. My bad. Okay, so if num1 is less than num2 and num1 is less than num3, then I know that num1 is the smallest. If it's not, then I'm going to go down, and this would be an elif, and I'm going to say, you know, num2 is less than num1, less than or equal to num1. Num2 is less than or equal to num3. If that's true, then I know that num2 is the smallest. I print it out, and I'm done. And if that's not true then this is where I would have an else, and I would output num3, and I'd be done. So, and there's just a few hints of where things might be. Um, converting types, and equality and relational operators, and Boolean operators. Now, here we have pseudocode. Pseudocode is a little bit different than flowcharts. And that's because it is supposed to, um, it's supposed to resemble the logic of what it is you would do. This should not be valid Python code. It shouldn't be valid Java. It shouldn't be valid C and C++. It should simply be pseudocode. And what you're using the pseudocode for is you're removing the need for all that syntax stuff. And you're writing down the logical steps as they would happen. So you kind of have to think like you're a computer at this point. Um, and so you're going to input three numbers, just like was in the flowchart. You're then going to test. And so here, when we're doing the pseudocode, I can write if, else, if, else. And so here you can see the multi-branch if, else statements. And by the way, those are in Cybooks, section 3.2. And we also are using the Boolean operator AND here. So these give you an idea, without it being in Python, of what you need to do. Um, so we've got if, elif, else, and we just go through and we ask the questions, the same questions that we asked in the flowchart. So this is 3.12. And 3.12 is not easy. 3.12 deals with, um, it's, it's pretty complex. Let's go and just read through it. Okay. This will be the longest program that you have written to date. And what it requires is they've given you this series of dates. When is spring? When is summer? When is autumn? When is winter? And these are going to take not just the simple if, else statements, but you're going to have to nest stuff. 
because it's not just if it's in March, it's in the spring. They've they've sliced some of the months by date. So somebody's going to input a month and somebody's going to input a day. And then based on that month to date, you're going to have to figure out using this chart what is happening. So we ha we know that there are 12 months, so you can't put in, you know, um, purple and have it be a valid month. So you have to check. You have to do an if statement that validates whether or not um, that, you know, that whether or not purple is a month. And then you're going to have to validate if the days are correct. Somebody puts in 99, it's not going to be a valid input. Um, and then you have to go and you have to see, based on the month and the day, what season is it in. So this is a series of complex branching. This is multi-branch and nested. And here we have just um, a flow chart and th there this is one of the reasons why I don't do flow charts after module three because they become so complex this is just a small visual we input somebody put inputs a month and a day and then we have this if month is January and day is greater than one and day is less than 31 so we have a couple of ands, so this is a compound statement. If it's true, we're going to output winner, and we're going to be done. Otherwise, we have to go through this entire flowchart and more. Okay, This is the pseudocode for 3.12. This shows you the structure of this very large, um, yeah, this just, just huge, um, sorry, drawn a blank. There's just huge related set of related statements. So the first thing we're doing is we're going to check if month is January. So if the month doesn't come up, we're going to output invalid. So you have to make it through all of these or, sorry, um, else if. I think that should have been an else if up there. Sorry about that. Um, these are all related statements. All of this is mutually exclusive, and sometimes you have nested statements. So if we take a simple month, like the month of January, we're going to say is month does, is month January. If your month is January, then we know we're going to do something that will be true, and none of this other stuff will matter. And we're going to say day greater than zero and day less than or equal to 31. So I've just checked the month is January and what the day is and then I can output winter. And if it's not January, I'll go down to the next one and say is it February? And if it's February and the days are right, then I'm going to output winter. And by the way, don't worry that February sometimes has 28 days and sometimes has 29. For this exercise, it's always 29. Then, actually, I'm going to finish this, fix this while I'm thinking about it. Oops. There we go. And I'll fix it before I upload it. Um... So this is this is what you're just going to do. Each one of the months has to be checked. Sometimes it's simple like out like outputting spring. Oftentimes it's not. In March, they're splitting the month, they're splitting the seasons based on a day in March. So first I have to say is month going to be March. If month is going to be March, then I go in and I take a look at the days and I say if day is greater than zero and less than or equal to 19, then I'm still in winter. If it's not, then I'm in spring. And if I put in something other than zero to 30, to 30 um, I'm going to say the output is invalid. So this is a nested if statement and 
that's how it matches up to this table. Okay? This table says spring is between March 20 and June 20. Summer is between June 21 and September 21, and autumn and then winter. And um, you'll notice that my if and else statements don't necessarily follow the order of this table, but for me they follow the order of the month or the months in the year. Um, but what you'll notice is every month that splits on a day, so March does and June does. So if I go over here, where'd that go? And I look at, oops, I look at March, you'll see that March has a nested if statement. You'll see that June has this nested if statement. Every month that where the seasons split based on a day in the month, then you're going, it's, it's going to be a trigger to you to know that you have to do this LF um, with then a nested if, LF, and else statement. I hope that's clearer than mud. Okay, so now we have the dollars, nickels, dimes, and quarters. And again, this is um, the beginning of the pseudocode, but there's nowhere near enough room. So, Oh, sorry, flow chart. So now I'm going to talk to you about the pseudocode. And basically, what they want to know is they want to know, given a value, what are the number of dollars, the number of quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So remember the floor operator we were just talking about in that example? This is where you have to use it. And modulo won't work. You have to use the floor operator. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do, and the first check I've got here is, if input value is less than or equal to zero, there's no change, and you're done with the program. You just are. Um, then you're going to go through and you're going to do all the calculations. After all the calculations and you have your variables, num dollars, num quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, then what you're going to do is you're going to figure out how to output it because that's what this program problem wants you to do. It wants you to go through and say, okay, I have some number of dollars that's greater than zero. That's perfect. I'm going to output the number of dollars, and then I need to either output the word dollar or the word dollars based on the number of dollars. If it's one, it's dollar. If it's multiple, it's dollars. If you get confused, Go back and look at the one, the, the floor.py, and it will help you work through this problem. And I think that's it. Is there another one? The exact change. Nope. Okay, so those are the labs, and that is what we could cover of branching in an hour. Do you guys have any questions? Does anybody have anything they want to discuss? Okay. I will call it, and you guys have a wonderful evening. And if you're in my class and you're having problems, just feel free to uh, reach out to me. No problem. Talk to everybody later. I'm going to end the meeting.